much as possible. <laughs> well, I, I think uh, you bring up a really important point. There is an incredible shortage of uh, Blacks and people of color um, in STEM fields. Uh, I'll probably speak from the medicine point of view. Um, medical school um, was traditionally and historically from the beginning um, white men and most medical schools uh, refused women and refused people of color, which resulted in some historically black colleges forming and, and medical schools, in fact, so that, that people of color would have an avenue for obtaining higher education and medical school education. But I think there's been, you know, structural racism in our institutions and in um, many of our policies and practices that have um, made it even more difficult for um, people to get into medical school and to do well in medical school and, and to get residencies and um, fellowships and positions. And so some of it has been just, you know, the, the constant oppression and microaggressions that people of color face being um, constantly um, challenged that they weren't smart enough, weren't good enough, being, um, uh, taken for um, non-medical students being, you know, um, stopped by security and questioned for who they are. Um, and, and that creates incredible stress. Um, we also have had um, grading systems that were not always objective and that were subjective um, and led to um, people who are the majority white people getting higher grades, higher honors and awards. So things like having people who've gotten honors and awards be the only people who can nominate people to get honors and awards and then having people vote. And so if you're in a minority and you're um, kept out of the, the inner network, then you're less likely to be uh, nominated for honors and awards. If it requires a vote of the majority, if you're in the minority, you're less likely to be um, elected for these honors and awards. So, so, so when I think about, um, you know, the, the people that wind up in medical school or in STEM fields, I have to go back well earlier, decades earlier to what I call the pipeline and the very leaky pipeline where who gets through has often been centered in whiteness, uh, in maleness. Um, I will just share that when you go to uh, Dr. Frazier's office, uh, you see a stunning wall as you wait for her to be free. Um, uh, and those are prior chairs of her department. And, um, and so as I waited for, for Dr. Frazier to be free, I counted uh, exclusively white men and then Vicki's picture. Um, and, and, so, so, and that is in 2020. So, so this pipeline to these fields, medicine to STEM to, um, and how one gets through and how one gets diverted starts very early and is systematically, um, you know, produces the outcomes that we have today. And, you know, we have to go earlier and earlier to understand how the outcomes that we're getting are produced and where we fall down. And those, those are based in systemic kind of diversions of people of color out of, out of particular fields, and they're incentivized by what we call merit systems. I have been a professor for oh, a long time, uh, 23 years, and um, what has been interest to me, interesting to me is that every place that I have been has focused on uh, recruitment efforts and getting people into the pipeline without always worried about the culture that we were creating at the schools for people to actually stay in the STEM fields. So when I was an assistant professor in 97, um, of those, only two of us have made it through and I'm the only one who's a full professor today out of 10 people. And a lot of it was that when um, a minority faculty comes in, into on the campus, a lot of times people, I call them, will like diversity track them, where they want them to um, be on every diversity panel, um, give them a lot of uh, extra service work. And it is something that is, you know, psychic pay. It feels great, but it never ends up on in your promotion and tenure dossier. And, and so I also feel that it happens very early in the tracking, just like um, 
you know, Vicki and Mary talked about, but it also happens later on in that um, when I came to WashU nine years ago, I got a call from the St. Louis American that they wanted to interview me because I was the first African woman who had reached the level of full professor. And I said, that cannot be, but it was true. And it is not because there are not a lot of talented uh, people out there. It's just, I feel that there has to be more of an, there has to be more of an emphasis on the culture that we are creating for everybody to be successful and not, um, and, in order to enhance their career in whatever they choose they want to be successful in. This isn't really my professional experience, but I'm thinking all the way back to recruitment to college. So um, as you can see, I'm white, um, but I'm a graduate of Flint Public Schools. I was one of the few white people in my grade and the Ivy Leagues recruited heavily in my public school, but they condescended to us they made it sound like they were doing us a favor by taking people from our school. And well, there was a lot of encouragement. So let me go back a bit. This would have been in the um, late 1980s, early 1990s. Um, but there was a certain way that they talked to us as a group that was different when they spoke to me, me, white person alone. And so I got this interesting viewpoint, even back then, about how they um, want them to join, but at the same time, give off vibes that you're unwelcome. I think we still need to work on today that universities recruit heavily, maybe not in the best way, and then need to think about what they do, what to do when they bring people of color who are underrepresented underrepresented to their campus. Elementary schools in Missouri suspended 14.3% of black students at least once in the 2011-2012 school year compared with 1.8% of white students. So there's you know so many more times difference. When children are out of school um, how much that disadvantages them educationally, but also how much it disadvantages them socially and sets them up for basically being labeled sort of what expectations other, we know from research that what expectations um, instructors have for students is powerful in just how everything about their education plays out from their, you know, how they are perceived as a student to then what scores they're actually going to get on tests. So um, there's, you know, an incredible disparity that begins very, very early, but it also never stops. Obviously, all of the students who got to Washington University as undergraduates are highly capable and, you know, maybe were protected from some of this earlier on, more likely survived it in, in you know, sort of in spite of um, the, the disadvantages and disparities they faced, uh, but they're still treated differently. We still see disparities in grading that are not explained by differences in test scores or any other, you know, objective criteria we can find. We know that there are differences in grading that are unexplained other than by, you know, the race code that's in our admissions database.